Welcome everybody to this workshop on data visualization. This workshop will focus on how you build different kinds of data visualizations using R. Now the point of data visualization is really to be able to communicate visually uh, key aspects of your data or information to a reader or reviewer. Data visualization, when done well, uh, can be exceptionally successful at communicating structure that's present in your data or perhaps trends over time. So we're going to start this workshop with a very brief video. Uh, the rest of the workshop will involve you uh, going through the script um, that's contained within this worksheet uh, and coding a number of different visualizations in R. So I just want to begin by giving you a very brief uh, introduction to some classic visualizations. Uh, this one from um, the mid 19th century uh, is very famous. This is uh, John Snow's map of a uh, cholera outbreak in London uh, in 1854, which was all centered around a contaminated water pump here in Broad Street. You can kind of see all of these black squares corresponding to cholera cases, and you kind of see at the center is this pump here. So this, and this is a picture of it uh, taken, taken recently. So it's a really interesting example about how you can use a particular type of data visualization to understand uh, perhaps something that's, that's been happening. Um, so that's kind of one of, the, one of the sort of earliest classic examples of data visualization. Another one, uh, which I think is really neat, is this Ruse chart or Coxcomb, which was actually uh, you know, developed by Florence Nightingale, uh, who I'm sure you know for, for you know, other, other reasons. Um, but she was also uh, very good at uh, you know, developing new ways of uh, visualizing data. Uh, and these kind of visualizations have had a huge impact as well. So these visualizations that, that she developed um, capture all the causes of death in the army in the East um, during, during the war in the uh, round about the same time actually as, as, as John Snow's visualization in sort of the mid 19th century. And you can read uh, this description here on the left, which explains what the colors in each of these different wedges mean. So again, it's a very nice, uh, clear, simple way of communicating potentially some quite complex uh, information to people. So, you know, visualizations when done well, uh, can be very successful um, at communicating uh, complex uh, data, relationships between different variables uh, and whatnot. And perhaps one of the classic books that I'd recommend you have a look at is this one by Edward Tufte. It's, the, uh, it's called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information and it's absolutely full of fantastic examples of uh, great um, you know, instances of data visualizations, uh, but also actually some of the worst data visualizations. Um, and I guess when we've been doing data visualizations in psychology, uh, you know, maybe in sort of your undergraduate days, you were using probably software like SPSS, and you might have just been presenting uh, bar charts and things like that. And actually, one of the worst kinds of visualizations you can construct uh, to communicate information in your data is actually a bar chart. So bar charts are commonly used, but they can be very misleading. So they're relatively limited in terms of what they communicate. So here is uh, a bar chart where we've got two experimental conditions just labeled as A and B. We've got some outcome measure measured in milliseconds. And we'll kind of see that for condition A, the average uh, is maybe about 1950, something like that. We've got standard error bars, measure of variability. Uh, for condition B, we see our average is about, maybe about 2,400. And again, we've got a measure of variability. So at first glance, you might think, well, this looks fairly reasonable to me. We've got information about uh, central tendency in our data, and we've got information about variability. But what's really important is that bar graphs actually don't tell us anything about the underlying distribution of the data. So they don't allow us to see the raw data uh, themselves. It's kind of generating these kind of visualizations. So the problems with this are nicely illustrated by a very famous example, Amscorm's Quartet. So here I've plotted uh, four visualizations. The 
black circles correspond to the raw data points. The uh, blue uh, diagonal lines correspond to the, um, the regression line. What's interesting about Anscombe's Quartet is for each of these four different visualizations, the mean of X is the same, the mean of Y is the same, the standard deviation for X is the same in all these four visualizations, the standard deviation of Y is the same in all of these four uh, visualizations. Each of these four visualizations has the same uh, Pearson's R regression coefficient. And the same regression line can actually be fitted to the data as well. So if we were describing these data using measures such as mean, standard deviation, uh, correlation, regression, we'd think that all of these uh, data um, distributions are actually the same underlying each of these four panels. But you can see that they're not. The actual raw data points underlying each of these four uh, you know, panels are actually very different from each other. Some scums quartet highlights the problem where if you're uh, not presenting raw data to people, you're kind of um, obscuring or misleading them because they're not able to understand the raw data that are kind of underlying the visualizations that you're developing. Box plots are very widely used. So if you were to look at a, a box plot of a particular data set, it might look something like this. Uh, if we've got the median here, we think the median is probably about the 1250 line. Uh, the 25th and 75th percentiles for the data are about 480 and 1980. So those are the kind of inferences that you would make if you saw data presented in this kind of uh, aggregated sense, in this sort of box plot uh, sense. But if we were now to add the raw data to this visualization, as I've done here, we'd actually see the circles here correspond to the raw data points. The data are clearly bimodal, okay? There actually isn't a point in the raw data anywhere near a measure of central tendency. I've got a whole bunch of data points down here and a whole bunch of data points up there. And we actually lose that information uh, by not presenting uh, you know, the raw data overlaid on the plot to our uh, viewers. And you can kind of see where I've plotted the distribution shape. It really highlights the fact that the, um, the distribution in this case is actually bimodal. Okay, so there are, two, there are two peaks to it. So we'll be looking at some of the ways in which we can better represent our data in this worksheet. Uh, we'll actually be looking at a way of using um, a violin um, geometry to actually capture the shape of the data uh, distribution in our data set. And we're going to be doing all of this using the ggplot2 package in R. So ggplot2 is a core part of the tidyverse. And within the ggplot2 package, we're going to be using the function ggplot uh, because that forms the basis for all data visualizations uh, using different packages in the tidyverse and different functions or verbs within the tidyverse. And all you really need to remember at this point is that there are three basic components uh, that you define when you're using ggplot to build a visualization. So first of all, you have to define the data that you want the visualization to be plotted with. You want to define the geometries, the actual geometric shapes that will represent the data in your visualization. So it could be points, it could be violins, it could be all sorts of different sorts of geometries. And you can actually have multiple geometries on the same plot. So you could actually plot, if you wanted to, a bar chart, but also with the raw data uh, themselves. So there'll be lots of different geometries that you can kind of add layer by layer to your ggplot. And then we've also got the third thing, which are the aesthetics. So the aesthetics of the geometric and statistical objects kind of define uh, the color, the size, the shape, and the position. But these are basically the three key components of uh, a ggplot um, you know, visualization that you will then use to build your, uh, your, your visualizations in this, in this worksheet. So the worksheet consists of uh, a lot of code that I've written, a lot of narrative that I've written, taking you through the process by which you actually build a visualization using the ggplot2 package. 
So what I would like you to do now is start working through that worksheet. Remember always at the start of something new, create a new project, a new project folder for this workshop. When you're writing your script, load your packages first. We're going to be focusing primarily, at least in the start of the worksheet, on just tidyverse uh, and work through the rest of the worksheet uh, and remember to save your script at the end. So there's quite a lot for you to work through, but it'll really, I think, nicely take you through all the stages uh, where you actually build up a visualization. It's always important to remember that once you've got a visualization you're kind of generally happy with, you can actually tweak a number of the aesthetics, such as the size of the font, uh, the position of the title, uh, the dimensions, uh, just, to make, just to make your visualization that little bit better, that little bit clearer. So you can actually spend a lot of time doing these various sort of tweaks, um, you know, once you've built your visualization and in the worksheet, I'll actually introduce you to some of the things that you might want to think about uh, in terms of varying while you're building those kinds of visualizations. So anyway, uh, on to the R script. Mm -hmm.